In this episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast, we sit down and talk with Dr. Rich Severn at the University of Illinois, Chicago, who is an assistant clinical instructor in the Doctor of Physical Therapy program, as well as himself, a cardiovascular and pulmonary clinical expert. We sit down and talk about respiratory muscle training, why we should care about respiratory muscle training, the impact that COVID has on inspiratory muscle training, and much, much more. Hope you enjoy the episode. What's up, what's up, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast with me, the human performance mechanic, or my real name, Nicholas Rolnick. I'm here today with Dr. Rich Severin, a friend and uh, respiratory expert. And <laughs> uh, we've known each other for years and um, just have a lot of nerdy conversations. And so we're just taking one of these nerdy conversations and putting it out there. Uh, so I'm very excited to talk to him about respiratory muscle training, why we should care about that, what the benefits are, how to apply it, um, if we can in our own training to be another avenue to help us optimize performance and potentially also utilize this for the physical therapists that are going to watch this on YouTube or listen to it on Spotify uh, or any other podcast that this end up being on uh, to work with our cl our uh, clients and our patients. So I'm very looking forward to this conversation. Welcome to the podcast, Doctor Severin. How's it going? Hey, well, hey, hey, Nick. Work. Should I call you Doctor Rolnick on this? Uh, this podcast I mean, you know, whatever. <laughs> some people, some people prefer, you know, their 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 uh, academic uh, or professional credentials. Some people like me. I really. Dr. Rolnick seems so formal. I uh, I definitely am more along the lines of just Nick, but, you know, I have that doctorate to throw around if fair, right? somebody is uh, questioning me. So. <laughs> fair, 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 fair. Well, I, I, I may call you Nick for the purposes of this episode. Perfect. That's totally, <laughs> totally okay yeah, yeah. and actually condoned. So fair, thank you. Fair, fair. All right, man. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for having me on, on this podcast, man. Um, you know, when we were talking about this, you you know, and seeing that the social media post you've made about starting one, I was like, I think, you know, with the network of people that you have and the work that you do, you know, I think this will be not just for BFR, but for anything, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, human performance, you know, you're, you're, you're a great person to get good you know, evidence informed uh, content out there. So I'm super excited to be on here. Well, I appreciate the, the kind words for, for our listeners, viewers, just tell us a little bit about yourself. <clears throat> and then more importantly, I know you've been in a lot of uh, involved in a lot of stuff. Um, so just kind of segue that into how you got interested in respiratory muscle training and kind of where you are in your own kind of area of RMT. That's a great question. So, um, so a little bit about me. Um, so I'm a physical therapist. Uh, I went to uh, Penn State for undergraduate. Uh, from you know, uh, undergraduate degree in kinesiology, movement science, and then of course went to PT school at the University of Miami down in Florida, um, and then uh, followed that with a cardiopulmonary residency at the University of Wisconsin Madison, the VA, sorry, the VA in, in Wisconsin Madison and the UW, and then uh, did an ortho program at UIC, and then followed that with my PhD um, in rehabilitation science with focus on cardio respiratory physiology and obese patients. Um, and that's kind of where my research and clinical practice uh, aligns. I was a faculty member at UIC, coordinator of the bariatric program, and kind of you know doing research in that area. So where where my interests all started, um, it you know I always go back to you know when I was applying to PT school. You know I my you know I was an athlete. That's why I brought up my undergraduate. I was an athlete in college. I played rugby for Penn State, and uh, my only real exposure to PT was in sports performance. And I went to UM for that purpose. Like I want to live in South Florida, work with athletes, you know, and just do that thing. And uh, while I was in school, uh, we very, I very fortunately had an excellent professor by the name of Larry Cahalan, um, who's a physiologist as well, and a PT and a cardiopulmonary PT and kind of 
you know, reinvigorated my interest in physiology because I didn't know PTs did anything remotely involving like human phys and exercise testing and stuff like that. And that, that was kind of the mainstay of his career and working with patients with heart and lung conditions. And uh, so that reinvigorated you know, my interest. And I remember just spending um, hours and hours after class, just picking his brain in his office. And, and he was a big, he was a big researcher in respiratory muscle training. So my interest kind of started there, particularly in heart failure. And then we followed that up with our cardiopulmonary course taught by Merrill Cohen. And then, um, you know, in residency, just seeing these patients with, you know, limitations to exercise, you know, due to breathlessness. And then again, you know, seeing that again through residency and in the bariatric program. So um, it's all, it's all from my observations clinically to seeing, you know, how much, how impactful breathlessness can be, um, how the breathing muscles are often overlooked um, as a, as a contributor to, to breathlessness and exercise intolerance, especially in the States in, in, in physical therapy practice, we, you know, I'd say respiratory muscle testing and training is a, more of a mainstay in other countries, Brazil, um, throughout the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, even, uh, it just, you know, I, for, for whatever reason, it just hasn't really taken off, um, in the States, despite the number of, uh, you know, patient populations that could benefit from it from benefit from it. So, yeah. So I guess that's a little bit of, a little bit of my story. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned the respiratory muscles being overlooked. Um, what from a performance perspective would people think about implementing respiratory, you know, training and, what do we currently know about the underlying mechanisms as to why this is actually helpful to okay. performance? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so what one caveat I'll say for for most people, um, you know, the the imposed demands on the breathing muscles never really approach or approximate or cer certainly don't supersede the envelope of function or the, the reserve that you have of the breathing muscles, even during exercise. Um, this has been, this is going back years looking at acute respiratory muscle fatigue um, and even like the subsequent changes that can happen with like blood, blood gases at extreme. It's very rare that your, your respiratory system, both your lungs, your circulatory system and your breathing muscles fail you in terms of exercise performance there. You have an incredible reserve. Now that changes in clinical populations, we'll maybe get into that a little bit, like heart failure, COPD, if you smoke or have pulmonary hypertension, cystic fibrosis, all kinds of different things, neurological conditions. But in an athlete, um, usually not something that's going to be a, you know, um, a detriment, right? Something that's going to be like be a limit. Now, there is research um, looking at as a performance, maybe advantage, right? Maybe something that you could like, you know, I always say that, like, you know, and you you know this from your time as an athlete and now and what you do now as a, as a PT and in strength and conditioning and performance that, you know, for a high level athlete, you know, those marginal gains sometimes can make a difference. So um, that, so that's where I say probably, you know, for an athlete, if that's something, you know, if they're, you know, a competitive athlete, you know, maybe a professional athlete looking for something, you know, and you're always looking for something in addition to the the routine you know hard yards in the gym and training you know that could be a nice adjunctive treatment um and the mechanism by which we think that respiratory muscle training improves performance both from a clinical standpoint for again patients with weakness or endurance impairments of the breathing muscles um, or for individuals who are getting looking for performance advantage it's the same principles as any other muscle right in the body and so the way i was trying to reframe it to people you know like it the same principles of testing same principles of training are, are pretty applicable basically you're improving the ability for the muscles to either produce force right or sustain like repeated bouts of force production um so or or you know improve resiliency to the teeth um so that's basically this the same principle so we test you know the breathing muscles either at their max and train them within a certain parameter of their max, usually about 60%, 50-60% of their max to improve strength, lower volume, same exact concept for strength improvements. And, you know, if you're doing bicep curls or bench press, we're trying to improve endurance, 
and we're going to test the muscles to see you know, how long they can fatigue and we can get into specifics on that. And then you're training the same exact way. So that the nice thing is like when we, you know, I, I, a lot of like my mission and I've, you know, I've been, you know, given talks on this internationally, nationally, we're giving another talk at CSN is to try to demystify it. It's actually a very simple, the very simple form of testing and a very simple form of training it doesn't require a ton of equipment, certainly cheaper than, you know, most things you find in a PT clinic or in a gym. Um, but if, if, you know, if that's something you want to look into or to intervene with, like there are ways to do it that are evidence-based that are, and that can have a meaningful impact, especially for people that, that do have breathing limitations uh, with exercise. And again, it's very often overlooked, um, in terms of the contributor. Okay. So we have in the average person, they're not, they're, they're necessarily, they're going to have a lot more in reserve than, Absolutely. than we're, we're, we're using. But when you talk about breathing, respiratory muscle training in particular, are you talking about the ability to bring in air or is it just, is it having to do with the ability of pulmonary gas exchange oh, or yeah, are they all, question. they good all question. coming into, are, are they all interplaying with that? Uh, it's really more the, the ventilation. So it's move, the movement of gas in and out of the lungs, the breathing muscles aren't going to have much of an effect on, on respiratory, maybe indirectly, because if you bring in better volume and move better volume out, but uh, that's a very, very indirect mechanism. Um, but it's primarily your ability to produce force, to draw air in. And then during exercise, you know, you, when you have forced expiratory maneuvers as you, as you exercise to move air out in a forcible uh, manner as well. So it's primarily a, in improving that. Um, and again, like, you know, you know, the work of breathing at rest, just, just to kind of give a, um, you know, a, a good way to kind of conceptualize it. If you think about, you know, what you, when you're breathing at rest, you typically need to produce about five at most, maybe 10 centimeters of water of pressure to draw a normal tidal volume, about 500 milliliters per breath. Um, typically in a, you know, young, healthy male, um, somewhere between 40 ish, you know, anywhere under 40, you should produce about a hundred centimeters of water at your max it should be about a hundred centimeters at minimum. Um, younger people can see 120s or higher. And that's the, that's the average women's going to be somewhere around 90. And this is all related. Like these differences in biological sex is related because if you're a larger individual, right, your, your peak absolute force should be higher, right. Which makes sense. Your bigger body. So um, where, before so, you continue on, yeah, when you're saying like uh, five or the, I think you said centimeters of, of, of water, what, where's, what specifically like, is it, it within a tube? Is it what, what, how are you kind of quantifying that? Like uh, that's just a, it's a, just a measurement that we use in, in respiratory. It's like analogous to like, it's a pressure measurement. It's analogous okay. to like, it's the, I guess the amount of pressure to move, if you had a tube, right, to move one centimeter, like, like a okay, tube yeah, of water. that's I just want to clarify. It's, it's it's analogous to like a millimeter of mercury, right? Like that same concept, like how much pressure does it require to move, you know, a, a thing of mercury up one uh -huh. millimeter. Same concept with centimeters okay. of water, but we use centimeters of water for 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 respiratory pressures, because uh, they're typically I'm not going to get to the weeds. It's a little bit we use centimeters of water for respiratory. Um, so to draw in a, um, a normal breath, about five to 10, typically a male is going to produce about a hundred centimeters of water at their max, you know, force production female is going to be around, you know, 90 or above. Um, and so when you take a normal breath, like you're, you're operating at pretty, pretty high efficiency rate, right? Which makes sense, right? Like. And that's true for pretty much every muscle. If you think about it, like, like, our hopefully, ideally, right? Like walking, like, you know, the amount of force you have to produce with walking versus like, you know, the, you know, your peak force production, your quadriceps, right? Like it's, you know, analogous to that. We do things that we do repeatedly at an incredibly high efficiency rate, um, rate right? Because just think about evolution. Um, and now at exercise, 
um, that the work of breathing does increase for, for several reasons. One, like, you know, you're breathing much faster. So your, your rate goes up. So that's going to impose a higher demand as well as like, there's higher, um, higher, um, airway resistance changes. Cause you have like a faster movement of volume or of through. So, so, you know, there certainly is an increase in the work of breathing, but it never gets close to what your reserve is usually um, in terms of like, you know, contributor to fatigue in a healthy individual. Now, in someone with like a condition like heart failure, COPD, like that, you know, either the peak force production can drop off, right? So again, like we said, about a hundred normal, we consider for like an, a, for a male. We can see a peak pressure in some populations in the 40s right um you know so or even lower um so maybe at rest like they're operating pretty close to their margins and then during exercise they may go above that like they may like get get shortness of breath um so that that's you know where that comes in and if we identify weakness so we can you know implement a training program to improve the strength of those muscles that's, that's basically how it works so we're, we're you know if someone reports shortness of breath we can test the muscles, see like what's their peak force production. Um, and then if we identify weakness, um, typically we say weakness for the breathing muscles would be somewhere around 60 centimeters of water. So we say a hundreds normal, um, you know, but we typically say anywhere around 60 or less. Uh, and that's a lot of, there's a lot of debate on what, how do we quantify weakness, but 60 is about where we say we start thinking that's going to be a, a major issue. Um, and uh, if we identify weakness, then we can, you know, train the muscles, again, using the same exact principles that we'd use for, um, you know, for improving strength anywhere else in the body. What muscles are we looking to question. train here? That's a great question. So everyone kind of gets hung up in the diaphragm, and I completely understand why. It's the primary breathing muscle. Um, it's about 80% of your inspiratory effort. Um, however, when you breathe, just like every other movement in your body, you don't, no muscle, no movement is done by a muscle in, in isolation. It's force couples, right? So your, you know, your intercostal muscles play a role as well, um, as well as your quote unquote accessory muscles. And then I, I, I put those in quotes because uh, that's really a misnomer. Um, your accessory muscles, uh, are they're always kind of active actually they're especially you know if you if you look at rib cage displacement even under a healthy individual um those upper you know your scalenes and muscles like that pec niner contribute to the upward displacement of your chest as you breathe like that's normal now they're not making a major contribution but they're always active um but when we're testing the breathing muscles like all all the muscles get um, mm -hmm. you know, activated because like we're, we're producing our peak and it happens during exercise. If you look at like, you know, EMG activity, you know, of the, of different muscles, like they go higher. I mean, again, the diaphragm's the main driver, but like it, it's not, it doesn't work in isolation. Uh, they all, I mean, and, and fortunately, fortunately so, because we can have other muscles kick in when we need to produce a little bit more force or to draw a little bit more breath in. When, so based on your, um, explanation of the amount of functional reserve that yeah. exists um, during, you know, athletics or well, day to day, but even during athletics, do you really see that when we talked about that, you know, 1% of the population or, or looking at that 1% performance gain, what, what, um, you know, athletes, do you think could benefit the most? For me, it seems that anything that's going to create a severe, you know, ventilatory stress mm -hmm. is going to potentially benefit. So long distance running where you're trying to maintain the highest amount of speed, um, CrossFit, where you're, you're really trying to perform as much as you possibly can close to your VO2 max as possible. Mm -hmm. um, what what kind of do, do you think in terms of the yeah. sport? Yeah, so um, there are, um, I'll put this in your, 
um, in the chat. There was, was a recent systematic review published, I think it was in Journal of Strength Conditioning and Research uh, back in, uh, actually, it's a little bit older than I thought it was. Yeah, 2013. I'll put it in the chat. Uh, and there's been systematic reviews upon systematic reviews because this is like the age. I mean, respiratory muscle training has been around for 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 a bit. It's gotten way more popular. There's been like two two eras, I say, where its popularity has spiked. In, you know, um, like early 2000s to like to like maybe 2010, there was a big spike, and then 10 years later with COVID, huge spike in interest. Um, and we'll maybe talk a little bit about that too, if you're interested, but, um, so, uh, I think the populations that it's been studied in, um, most extensively, and it, it, this is probably maybe like selection bias or regional bias, because like a lot of the work in respiratory muscle training, again, is done in like countries outside of the United States, especially historically. So like Brazil is a big one. So soccer players that it's been tested in. And volleyball players, it's been tested pretty extensively. Um, swimmers, that's been tested in. And I think it was a very recent one uh, looking at 800 meter sprinters. So um, so I think it's primarily sports are going to be like involving a lot of like again, high, high ventilatory demands, like training close to your, you know, or running close to your ventilatory threshold, like all out sprint efforts and stuff like that. Or, um, you know, long, like middle distance, a long distance running for, at high effort. So um crossfit i don't know because they're or maybe not in the traditional sense because uh you know typically with lifting i guess crossfit's not just lifting it's like lifting and like a lot of other stuff too but uh you know yeah i mean it's basically you're chaining so they have like uh metcons where they're giving four or five different tasks and they have to complete it in as short of a time period as okay. possible so they're chaining together full body to sprint or some sort of, you know, high, you know, demand exercise. And so like the 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 rationale to implement, um, which, again, I, I guess I'm, I'm interested in hearing if you've ever heard of isocapnic training and what that is, because my impression of that was basically kind of what you were talking about it was he was breathing he says he breathes into a balloon and the balloon provides the resistance and when you're you basically get used to the uh gas exchange like of of the fact that you're blow you're creating more carbon dioxide it's getting trapped and so you're creating a um you know, an adaptation inside the pulmonary system to allow you to operate at a relatively higher intensity. Um, it seems yeah. like that might be a little different than what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> there's a lot of uh, approaches to uh, training, breathing that uh, I think a little get a little bit to the weeds and then often like miss the mark on probably what's what's probably happening. Um, cause I mean, I'm not going to, not going to name names on stuff, but, uh, so isocapnic training, uh, really essentially what it's, it's a form of breathing training, uh, respiratory muscle training, because I think the goal of it primarily is to keep, so the, the problem with, if you breathe repetitively, right. Especially at, at high rates when there isn't like carbon dioxide produced or metabolic work, like if I'm sitting here start to hyperventilate mm -hmm. carbon dioxide in the blood temporarily drops right and if you do that long enough you'll pass out because you have vasoconstriction in the head because you wash out your co2 reserves um and what the, the 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 principle of that form of training is to keep capnia or so co2 levels constant while breathing at high demands so the i so what they do by breathing at like they think i think they do like all out efforts of breathing for like 30 seconds and the idea is that you're you're training basically like doing sprint like sprint or mm -hmm. like uh, anaerobic power training if you're doing like sprinting um, to you know try to sustain that force output right which which is basically what you'd be doing with exercise you breathe at higher clips um, and doing it without you know without having to exercise so um, so that that is like the mechanism whether that's making an adaptation in the pulmonary vasculature I, I I'd say that's probably doubtful. Um, what's probably happening or the ability for you to exchange gas, it's the ability for your muscles maybe to tolerate 
force production or repeatedly breathing you know at a fast fast rate um without again washing out co2 so you, you know you don't get you don't get dizzy but it's not going to affect like sensitivity it may improve its performance because it's again you're you're training the muscles at a at a fast rate and to your point about like we talked about like you know you know why the gains of adding respiratory muscle training um to you know a performance training program for an athlete is, is by nature of training hard and having to breathe repetitively at higher workloads your muscles will get stronger like it just they're, they're active too right but, but uh, maybe in someone who can't be active right can't do like physically do the hard work um or has kind of breathing limitations um you can you can try to mimic that by using respiratory muscle training or isocapnic hyperventilatory training um so that's kind of like that's like the the one of the rationales for for using either so does this um does this thought process kind of play out where so if if you're you're saying that the 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 whole system has high functional reserve mm -hmm. To me, thinking back on muscle physiology, mm -hmm. my head goes through, all right, well, if if we're operating at such a low level and we have such a high amount of functional reserve, to me, it seems like the, the fiber typology of these breathing muscles, or at least the ones that would be predominantly responsible for the initial or the, the resting or even a low level type breathing effort are going to be very high in terms of type one fibers. Yep. So is that kind of how it presents? And so like the, the, the training in and of itself is really just trying to hit those type two muscle fibers that really aren't getting stimulated. Or, or it could be both. You could I mean, so there's, it's a mixed muscle, like every muscle, right? It's got a little mm -hmm. bit of both um because it's going to have different tasks it's imposed upon um so, but there are muscles that like there are fibers within the diaphragm um and not probably the other muscles too it's the diaphragm has been more extensively studied looking at fiber typology um but that there are more fatigue resistant versus more that are you know a little bit less fatigue resistant higher force output um and depending on what the limitation is so again like i mentioned typically when we're when people think of respiratory muscle testing, we're looking at peak strength, right? So, you know, your ability to produce, you know, your maximum either inspiratory pressure, which is a negative pressure, or expiratory pressure, positive pressure, you know, peaks. Um, however, as we've kind of discussed, you know, breathing, it, it, you know, it's not you, you hopefully never ever get to breathing at your maximum capacity. It's a very bad situation, actually. That happens, right? Um, and, you know, and if you think about like the breathing muscles, what they do is a, like, almost like a super endurance, like an ultra of ultra marathons. They're constantly going, right? Um, so, I mean, there's even a debate amongst people in this, in this field, like why do we test these muscles using a maximum strength measurement, right? Like it makes no sense, um, but uh, I digress. So we can test peak strength and then we can also do tests to see fatigue ability. So we can, uh, typically what you do, you do your peak strength test and then you have the patient or individual breathe against like 50% or 75% of their peak and at a set cadence um, for as long as they can until they fatigue. So you can assess endurance because some people have normal strength. In fact, obese patients, we find they have pseudo normalized strength this guy's we have a paper that's kind of coming out with some of these things um we test an obese patient um typically their MIPS are going to be higher which makes sense because if you like our maximum inspiratory pressure you know the peak peak you know inspiratory strength is going to be normal compared to you know biological sex and age um certainly not below that 60 centimeter of water threshold we consider weakness and they a lot of them have shortness of breath. It's actually one of the major limitations. Um, why I think that happens, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pretty good with that. I, I know why it happens. Because um, if you look at, you know, the, the worker breathing at rest in an obese patient, it's higher. They have, 
you know, changes to chest wall resistance and airway resistance because their lung operating volumes are smaller. Your lung operating volumes are smaller than normal. You have less air in your lungs. They have a restrictive defect in their lungs. Um, it's reversible with weight loss and stuff like that. But when that happens, there's less air in the lungs physically. And that's when there's less air running through the airways, the caliper size of the airways is smaller, which, you know, makes the work of breathing because there's a resistance component to it as well. So they've a, they're, they're kind of under load constantly, which may, makes sense why their peak strength is preserved. It's just like we see in the leg muscles in an obese patient. They have higher absolute or normal or higher absolute strength in the, in the you know, if you do like a leg extension, peak, peak strength. But when we normalize it to body weight, they're much weaker. So, and there hasn't been a great, great equation yet to kind of factor in body weight to breathing muscles. But what we've observed, again, same thing, obese patients normalize a relatively normal peak strength. But there are tests that look at endurance. So if we have them do an endurance test, they tend to fatigue a lot faster. And a test that I like to use clinically and in my research is uh, called the TIRE, or a test of incremental respiratory endurance, which has the patient, you know, breathe in to their maximum. So we look at peak force production. And then we see how long can you sustain peak force production? And then we, we find some pretty interesting findings in obese patients that get Peak is normal, but they their slope is super high. They fatigue super quickly. Um, so we're, we're again like uh, yeah, there are ways to test either. And again, I think some is very relevant because some people can have completely normal peak strength and have an endurance impairment or fatigability impairment. Some can have you know relatively normal endurance but a strength impairment. It's just like any muscle; like you can have either or or both <laughs> can be bad, right? So. Mm -hmm. um so yeah yeah so i think we covered a little bit of what we can expect with respiratory muscle training i want to briefly segue into covid and the what what you've seen with covid oh man uh, yeah. in in regards to shortness of breath and what kind of the 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 more updated thoughts are regarding the pathophysiology. Absolutely. So uh, COVID, you know, and I published a couple of papers, you know, on this um, right from the beginning that have been like only just further supported our initial hypotheses. So COVID, um, you know, the the interesting thing about that, the, you know, the there's, a, there's a kind of a multiple factors for what's going on here. So the patients that were yeah, so kind of kind of kind of backing up here, kind of a full, full picture here. So patients that were at the highest risk for severe infections, right? Especially, you know, patients of obesity, the elderly. Um, you know, in obese patients, we talked about there can be some changes to the force production as well as work of breathing. So, you know, you know, if we have uh, an acute illness, which will further make it harder or more challenging to breathe they're going to have some problems, which may explain why that was a, a major risk factor for why you know, patients of obesity had severe cases acutely, required ventilation, right, and all the different treatments to kind of rest the respiratory system, you know, unload it, which is what a vent does. Um, so why they maybe had more severe symptoms. And then if you were ventilated, like on a mechanical ventilator, this has been well established. The, the breathing muscles, I would say, are kind of like quicksilver. Their adaptations, both positively and negatively, are very quick. It's because they're it's a highly vascularized muscle, which makes sense, very active muscle. So when we unload them, which, which happens when you're on a ventilator, they fatigue, or they, fatigue, they get atrophied and weak very quickly. Um, so if you were obese, you know, or had high risk factors, chronic disease, very common, unfortunately, in the United States. You get COVID, the high risk for having severe symptoms, being ventilated, and now you go to ventilate. It's going to take another another whammy, right, on the the breathing muscles, right? Which again, this is this is established. This has been both of these things have been well established for years. So, uh, which you know we think may explain why 
there was a, a, a large number of individuals that, you know, had these persistent symptoms post COVID and even in the acute phases, because, you know, in early reports back, even going back to 2020, 2021, that there were patients that were admitted that needed ventil ventilation that, you know, when, we, when they did like you know, fluoroscopes, imaging of their lungs, their lungs were clear, but they were sh incredibly shortness of breath. They were in respiratory failure and needed to be ventilated. Um, and we think it's because again, like they're had some issues with the work of breathing at rest relative to their respiratory muscle performance, been in balance, had a acute illness. And then after they've been ventilated, they, again, those muscles get super weak really, really quickly. And then they, and then they contribute to persistent dyspnea, even once they've been stabilized and discharged. What we've learned later on through further inquiries, um, so we put this out there that, hey, the breathing muscles may be a contributor to the dyspnea, exercise intolerance, and outcomes. We put this, we published this back in, was it April or early May of 2020? Like early, I was like, you know, like, it's my area. I, I work in, you know, you know, bariatrics, I mean, respiratory muscle testing, like, and these are the patients we're seeing again and again admitted. Like, I think we may want to look at this because again, breathing muscles are widely overlooked, you know, even in the U.S., you know, preventative task force. It's not even listed as something to, 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 to assess in terms of patients with dyspnea. But anyway, so we th we thought that was like, hey, this is important because they, these people had underlying issues at baseline. The, the virus is going to make the work of breathing harder. If they go on an event, it's going to be even another impairment to, 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 to the breathing muscles. Postmortem studies and even acute uh, studies looking at ultrasonographic changes have found, I think almost kind of con conclusively, that in addition to all those other things we talked about, COVID itself may cause a viral, like mediated myopathy to the breathing muscles, um, where there, you know, we found like they found higher rates of fibrosis in the in the diaphragms of postmortem patients. Um, you know, both both of ventilators, higher rates of fibrosis and myopathy in the breathing muscles. We saw ACE2 expression. So there's a weight and, and viral expression in, in those muscles. And then I have a colleague um, here, Shirley Ryan, Colin Franz, uh, here in Chicago, did an ultrasound. It found, you know, I think it was, I think it was like 40% of patients admitted in their, you know, in their inpatient rehabilitation facility in, in hospitals had radi had ultrasonographic changes indicating like myopathy and damage. So the virus itself may cause direct damage to the breathing muscles, which may explain, again, like the persistent symptoms that some of these patients experience post-COVID, despite, again, if you, if you look at some of these patients, not all of them, because there may be the lungs are damaged in addition to those breathing muscles, but there are some patients that have, if you took a chest x-ray or fluoroscope, their lungs look normal, their pulmonary vasculature looks normal, but they have this persistent dyspnea, and which, you know, if... You know, and when it happens, sometimes, unfortunately, I've seen, you know, comments from patients and clinically because I treat, I treat post-COVID patients and, you know, following the conversations on social media that um, they were really happy we put our paper out in, in ER, European Respiratory Review, talking about this, because it said like, hey, like, you know, you know, all of my pulmonary, you know, physicians and primaries, like, they don't think anything's wrong with me. And like, you know, in like, because no one's checked their breathing muscles. So COVID, uh, for a number of reasons, can can you know can you know can have um, you know, long term consequences on on the breathing um, in patients. And um, the good thing is, there have been studies now. Uh, was it McNary from Swansea in Wales? Um, I think Daniel Langer in Germany has posted, or sorry, Belgium. He's German in Belgium. And another group, I can't recall, um, have published studies supporting that respiratory muscle training um, improves dyspnea symptoms in patients post-COVID. So there are options, you know, sort of things for patients with these conditions. It's just getting, oh, Haley Bento as well from Utah, um, colleague of mine, good friend. Um, so that, you know, there, the good thing is like there is, there are interventions that can help these patients 
and all we talked about the sorts of testing and training it's just getting people mm-hmm. aware of these things that hey like if you know especially if patients that have dyspnea have a normal chest x-ray like everything else checks out but they still have this persistent dyspnea check the breathing muscles um you know there are gold standard scientific ways of assessing them they're reliable and there's very easy ways for training them so uh, but yeah covid yeah yeah a multitude well yeah i mean i think uh, the reason why obviously i asked is because i recently had covid and um have been undergoing or have had shortness of breath but paradoxically i haven't really noticed it impact my exercise um Hmm. so i have a a max cardiac test on uh you know in in the coming days which will hopefully you know turn i'm pretty positive it's going to turn out negative um but it's it is intriguing because for me as somebody who wants to know it's very difficult when i have resting shortness of breath but then i can run four miles like it's, it's so interesting to me um, that, and again, to be fair, it's actually gotten a little bit better, um, yeah. which is giving me a lot of, of uh, relief, but it is, I can only imagine for those, for those patients who have dyspnea at rest that gets worse oh, yeah. with exertion. Um, like, cause I was diagnosed with mild long COVID, but long COVID from what I have looked at is, you know, worse exercise, worse. It's like, I just don't fit neatly into, into that box. Um, but I can only imagine the shortness of breath, um, how that is distressing. Oh my God. Yeah. For, for, I mean, it's, it's, it's honestly like crazy to me to think that there are people that are walking around that or even just sitting and resting because mm-hmm. that's kind of where I was at, where you just can't catch your breath, and yep. and and it's sad because it's then it as you said it kind of perpetuates this whole thing where our society in general is very sedentary. Now they can't exercise even if they want to, or yep. they they very much need a ultra guided program um, to do so, and it's really. I'm I'm interested to know if you've thought about the um, the implications from a public health perspective, how this COVID is going to. I know we've already seen it impact in the short term, but how ten years from now, what you know this this might end up being from a public health perspective. Yeah, you know I, I'm I'm glad you brought that up about you know the impact you know, shortness of breath can have on an individual. If you think about it, like. Yeah, anything that you do routinely, and if it just if it becomes like incredibly challenging to do, that that, that that's a like a, that can have a very meaningful negative effect on you, right? You know, because um, I mean, we take breathing for granted because we you know and, and we're fortunate to do that. It's really easy. We've evolved to do that. But when breathing becomes difficult, like that's incredibly distressing. Like that's something you need to do, like you know, from your very first breath to your last breath, and if that's physically taxing like that's you know or they just like getting up to walk you know in your in your house right um or go up a flight of stairs you know you, you get super winded um you know and we see this in, in the in the you know the you know the population i work with in in uh, bariatrics the dyspnea being a very major barrier for why those patients are becoming active um but from a public health standpoint do you mean in terms of like dyspnea management or like respiratory muscle testing or it could, it could or- just be for me, it, it more is like right now we have a population that, you know, uh, according to last year or two years ago, about 70% overweight and obese. Mm-hmm. And we have something along the lines. It varies based on what publication you read, but a large portion of individuals are not meeting either aerobic oh, or yeah. resistance exercise guidelines. So now you add the additional wrinkle mm-hmm. of dyspnea at rest Mm -hmm. and those people that i'll be honest with you they're probably getting kicked around the medical system and they might just need some rmt to help get them over the hump so they can start to become active my whole thing is and i'm as you know extremely extremely passionate about facilitating exercise in general whatever you can do because of the multi 
you know, I'm gonna actually going to send you this paper that I found that was published just yesterday, which I'm going to make a post about, which is fantastic. The multi-system um, impact of exercise and how it, it's just, it, it's, it's huge. So for me, I'm interested in hearing kind of where you see this on a worst case scenario going if we're not really paying more attention to this. Yeah, you know, um, in our, one of our, uh, are we like because like someone gave like a thumbs down and like a reaction i was like what? yeah i don't know what that was that but... <laughs> that's, that's like zoom what's going on here man um but, <laughs> yeah, yeah i don't know what no, that was i no, thought it was the, like uh... you being like thumbs down because the public health is going in the shitter yeah maybe. <laughs> is it an ai feature or something maybe i don't know Weird. i think it might be um but yeah, I, I think it's gonna get it's gonna definitely be worse. I mean, our one of our like you know our department head, good colleague and mentor and friend of mine, Ross Serena, has published quite extensively about this. You know, again, like the, the, like exactly as you mentioned, and we talked about this in, in our my publication that, um, you know, the, the the main issue with us and why I always hate when people compare outcomes in general between different countries, but especially in the United States and like New Zealand, for example, or like Sweden. Right, like our, very developed our, first world oh, countries. Well, we're developed too, but like our chronic disease and risk factors are completely different. Right? Oh yeah, <laughs> like yeah. So that's going to have a major difference in your outcomes. And so we and you know prior to COVID pandemic, we had an epidemic of obesity and chronic disease, which as you're absolutely has has gotten worse. Um, there's been publications about this supporting that like the obesity rate has gone up, physical inactivity has gone down. Um, a bunch of other things, you know, independent of whether people got COVID or not. And you factor that on top of that, especially with those who are at the highest risk for severe, you know, so it's, it's going to, it's going to be a spiraling issue if we don't really have um, a top down, you know, effort, you know, from the state level, federal level to encourage, you know, or, or make, you know, exercise more accessible um, as well too. And, and I think from a dyspnea management, like, you know, being more aware of there are, are interventions, there are screening tools that we can look at, you know, because again, like you, you're absolutely right. If, you know, and we run this, you get even out, you know, outside of COVID in our bariatric population, you know, the obese population, class two or class three obesity or higher, um, that they'll go to the primary care and they'll be whatever weight. They'll talk about, you know, they'll say, hey, you need to exercise more you know, go, go take a walk for 30 minutes a day, which sounds great. But like the patient's like, well, I can't even like walk in my house. So they got you. How am I going to walk 30 minutes um, until they get to me? And I'm like, well, there's some different things we can do. Let's look at your breathing muscles. Maybe we can, you know, start you off in a respiratory muscle training program. So your breathing muscles are able to tolerate that higher workload during activity. We'll do some other stuff too. Maybe some like you know, resistance training, which won't really up the vectory demands, but you're absolutely right. Like there, there, there's gonna, we're, we're already kind of seeing the, the lasting effects of COVID and the lockdowns, the infections that people got, the long-term consequences of COVID um, on our baseline poor health status. And like, we, we absolutely need to have, uh, you know, a, 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 a focused, initiative and i think i think that's where pts you know and you know and exercise professionals in general play a major role in because um you know there are some patients that like just can't just start on their own and they're never going to be able to start on their own because of all the different issues they have they need someone to kind of like tailor a program identify mm -hmm. the impairments and to help them get more active so um but yeah you know i i can yeah completely agree and again like the, the data supports this that um you know, our, our poor health status got significantly worse during COVID. Um, I mean, we, I, I mean, I see it I mean, anecdotally as well too. Like the, the one thing always, always breaks my heart. You know, we have patients in our bariatric program that were, were doing great. They had surgery, right. They, you know, they lost weight. They were you know, down however many hundred, you know, hundred pounds, whatever, going to the gym every day, like made the hat, made the habits of it. Lockdowns happened. Couldn't be outside. And then like, you know, fell off the wagon, fell off the wagon, you know, and it, yeah. it's like, that's, I was like, man, we gotta, you know, we gotta find ways to, and if it happens again, which, you know, hopefully this never happens again, we maybe need to find ways to like tailor access to gym and fitness facilities too, for people to be safe and exercise, you know, 
while these things are going because you know yeah the, the there's there's definitely you know especially for patients who are at a high risk of complications if they become less active um we got to find a way to you know keep keep gyms open safely or green open recreational spaces because yeah that i mean the number of patients i i've spoken to over the past couple of years that like we're doing super well and then everything changed and now, now, their, now their health is even worse um, than it oh. was you know it's it's heartbreaking yeah i think well you know this is my little soapbox before we wrap up um to say like instagram and social media doesn't make it doesn't make it easier on people because mm -hmm. I think, and I mentioned this probably on every single podcast in some way, shape or form is that there is this, this appeal to complexity. And unfortunately what that does is it leaves the everyday Joe and Jane who just ultimately need to get to the gym, get on the machines and just work hard for a couple yeah. of sets, spend 30 minutes in the gym maximum twice a week to get the vast, vast, vast majority of benefits. And instead we're talking about complex types of, of ways to train that literally have meaning, like no meaningful impact on 99% of the population. And I think that we just have to figure out um, how to best help our clients and patients without this appeal to complexity. And unfortunately, yeah. Instagram is definitely an area that uh, is is awful for that. Because um, yeah, as you yeah, just well, said, we just yeah. need to get people going to the gym, just get to the gym yeah. and, and get doing on something. The, do yeah. something. Something, yeah. Um, you have so to anyways, the, the complexity oh, thing. Yeah, the complexity thing. I, I, I And the breathing, breathing training is, is that way too, because you see a lot of like foo-foo, fantasyful, approaches to breathing and kind of woo mysticism stuff out there i'm like all right like you know you're, you're making things more complex than they need to be this isn't going to be meaningful and you know despite the fact that there is it's pretty simple for this testing and training and like that's going to work and that's what you know probably most people with dyspnea probably need to be doing right this is make your muscles stronger or make them more resilient to fatigue Right. Versus all these kind of weird contrived mm -hmm. things like it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, yeah, like, you're absolutely right. Like the, the basics work, the foundational principles work, you know, um, now work. It gets complex is convincing people to do things consistently. You know, that that's where I was like, hey, if you guys want to be creative, like there's there's still avenues to be creative and getting people to like mm -hmm. stay consistent. But the. The, the the meat and potatoes of 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 training are like the, the basics that, that's that's good enough you don't need to make things more complex than it, it needs to be yeah yeah I, go, I completely agree with you i mean there's i mean it even goes into the warm-up like yeah stuff and again i don't want to get off track on this but like there's no need to do a comprehensive body full body warm-up to get on machines or do strength training like it's it's just it's getting absurd um yeah. but anyways switching gears where can people find you i wanted you to just spend if you can like one minute talking about what what your course um what your course covers and uh where if you know any place that you're you're going to be at and yeah. if they're interested in setting up a course for rmt yeah. where they could reach out to great so my socials are was pretty i guess uh good foresight i was younger my it's PT reviewer. It's pretty much ever except for Instagram. It's PT underscore reviewer, but PT like physical therapist reviewer all together. Same on Twitter or X on an X now. Facebook. I have an, a website and then the email rich at PT reviewer.com. YouTube channel as well. I've got some free stuff on testing and training, which is probably enough to get the basics. Um, but I am teaching a course with some colleagues of mine um, at CSM uh, on, on how to implement a program. Um, which we'll, we'll get into the financials, the billing, um, the the use in different clinical populations. Um, we have a nice little resource for people too, like a handout on like how, how, like how to set up a program. Um, and then I have a course on MedBridge on respiratory muscle testing and training, as well as a specific one for COVID, um, which covers some of those, those those principles. So if you have that, check it out. If you want to use my affiliate discount code. Big surprise, it's PT Reviewer. So if you can remember PT Reviewer, you'll save yourself some, some bucks. 
And then I am uh, launching my first in-person course in a while. I'm super excited for it. Um, you know, now that things seem to be kind of evened out with COVID at, uh, it'll be, we'll be teaching it in Denver at, um, the national Jewish hospital out in Denver. Um, it's going to be primarily training up their clinicians, but I think the plan is to have some open slots for clinicians. So if you, if you're in the area, uh, especially the Denver, you know, Mountain West area, feel free to check that out. There'll be probably ads for that coming soon. Um, and then if you're ever interested in bringing me out to your facility to, to teach your course, always open to that. Again, reach out to me on, on my socials or at uh, rich at ptre.com. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for volunteering your time to appear today on this podcast. Great discussion. And uh, maybe we'll have you on at some point in the future. Maybe. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I'd love, I'd love to come in and talk about that complexity and condensing the nonsense about exercise, just getting people. There's a lot. I mean, that's oh, a whole, man. I'm actually yeah. thinking about making that a whole podcast to go through. Do should, should do a panel. That'd be like, a fun one. Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll figure, we'll figure something out. Yeah. But, uh, Maybe at CSM. You going to be there? You coming up? Yeah, I'm speaking on the last day. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And Maybe uh, I got the graveyard. Panel. Yeah. I got the graveyard one, but we'll, we'll oh, figure right. something out. Definitely. Um, definitely. Anyways. Thank you all for, for watching, listening, and that's the episode. And that was today's episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, I would love if you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. I really appreciate the support.